Welcome to the Miko Pellet Hour. I'm your host, Miko Pellet. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining. Today, I have a wonderful guest, Nurse Lana, who has just returned from a medical mission to Gaza. Now, we talk a lot, especially I talk a lot about Palestine, certainly about Gaza over the last few months. And uh, it's all political, really. Um, that's, that's really the focus that I, uh, that's really what I focus on. However, I think it's important to understand and to have a good uh, grasp of the enormity of the humanitarian casualties, the humanitarian catastrophe that has uh, befallen upon Palestinians, particularly in Gaza over the last few months um, and throughout all of Palestine. So um, as we all know, as we've heard on the news, Palestinian, I mean, not, uh, aid workers, humanitarian workers who have volunteered to go to Gaza have been killed. Journalists have been killed. So Israel does not um, show any, any particular uh, regard to the fact that people are coming from the outside to help Palestinians. Um, they kill without mercy, they kill without distinction. So to join a medical mission is, is to put your life on the line. It's to say, I'm willing to go to help these people who have been victims of a horrific, horrific slaughter, a genocide, um, with no aid, with no ability to take care of themselves, hospitals destroyed, um, food, nutrition, water denied, and so on causing a real humanitarian catastrophe. Um, but I'm willing to put my life on the line in order to do whatever I can to help. And that's what Nurse Lana has just done. And uh, we met at an event of the Palestinian American Medical Association where uh, you and um, other doctors who were there uh, were giving testimony and describing what you saw, what you heard, what you did the difficulties and the challenges. And so thanks for joining me today. This is thank incredibly, you. yeah, it's incredibly important to hear what you have to say. And thank you for your, you know, your courage and your willingness to go and, and do this just important work. Now I want to start, you know, over the time since we met, I've been thinking about some of the things that I've heard you say, some of the things I've heard the other doc the doctors who are there with you say. Um, and you describe the um, you described the emails, the correspondence with the organization, and there was an every email ended with some kind of a statement. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So um, after I applied with the nonprofit organization that I applied with, literally every email ends with pretty much a little statement saying you are going in on your own risk with um, the you know knowledge that you may not return alive. Essentially, that's what it ends with. So that's every not, email ended with that. That's not a small thing. I think I think it's important to let that sink in for a minute. I always say this when we talk about Gaza, we talk about Palestine, and the horrors are just there's, there's so many that people just kind of list them and move on. And I think it's time sometimes it's important just listen to that statement. Okay, you're a volunteer going. Uh, join, you know, applying to go on a medical mission. And this is what the organization that's hosting you is telling you yeah. that uh, you need to realize you may not return. And again, it's important to realize that the risk is not, is not from Palestinians. The risk is from what I consider one of the world's um, best armed, best, financed best fed terrorist organizations, which is this Israeli army. That is the risk. This army that is getting so many billions of dollars from the United States, that is the risk you need to watch out for. It's Yeah, it's sad. I mean, you pretty much have to go in with the, like I said, the knowledge and intention that you may not come back. So I did so. I drafted up a will. I mean, I'm fairly young and I never really thought about having a will until then. And I, um, you know, drafted up a will, handed all my passwords over to my brother, was like, here's my password to every single thing in my life. Um, th these are instructions for what I want you to do. God forbid I don't make it back. And 
I mean, sadly, as an aid worker, a humanitarian aid worker, you like literally have to think of death, like to help others. You know, it's weird, like that that the possibility that you may die helping others, it's sad, but that's how dire the situation is there. I mean, that's how intense and severe it is. So, I mean, yeah. So, and, this I, is not, and this is not a tsunami or an earthquake that is caused by nature. This is I, um, this is man-made and it's ongoing. It hasn't, so it's not like it stopped and now you're going there to help survivors. It's an ongoing catastrophe. The killing, the destruction, the bombing is ongoing. Now, right. the, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm a big believer in, in focusing on details. And when I heard you speak the other night, you talked just about, you had a really short presentation. All you talked about was the preparations, like what you said, the will and so on. And then um, you talk about, like you said, you packed very lightly because most of your luggage, what what, what, what did you take? Or oh, most of your luggage, what did you dedicate Yeah, that? most of my luggage. Um, so we had a approved list of items that we could bring with us, essentially, um, medical supplies. So I wanted to fill, I was allowed four bags of luggage. So I wanted to fill all of that with supplies more than, you know, clothes or items for myself. So it was, um, you know, uh, I had triage items like blood pressure monitors, stethoscopes, glucometers. Um, I had a whole bunch of medications, antibiotics, um, some numbing medications, um, vitamins, um, blood pressure meds. And then um, some surgical equipment um, and supplies, bandages, um, splinting materials, um, just a whole array of items. And then um, we had to provide our own food for two weeks because there's no food there. So I had to bring protein bars to last me for two weeks, essentially. Those were going to be my meals. Um, so I brought protein bars and some nuts and um, some liquid IV packets and a life straw. So, so not only, not only, again, just so the people listening kind of, you know, appreciate what you just said. Not only are you going to a war zone, not a war zone, you're going into a gen into a genocide that is taking place, and you're risking your life. But you have to make sure that you have enough food for yourself to sustain yourself while you're there because there might not be any access to food and so on. So besides all this, and, and then the equipment that you described are things that, I mean, you work at a hospital, you're a nurse. These are things that you take for granted are in the hospital. Oh yeah. And you have oh, to yeah. take this with you. You're going to be working at a, you're working, I'm assuming you're, you're, you're planning to be working at a hospital, yeah. such as whatever is left of hospitals uh, throughout the Gaza Strip. Yeah. And you have to bring all of the stuff. So then, so then you get there. So you float a Cairo. Talk about the, you know, you fly to Cairo. That's, you know, that's pretty simple. And then there's a long drive for people that don't know. It's a very long drive from Cairo, crossing the Suez Canal through the Sinai Peninsula until you get to Rafah. And it's right. not an easy drive under normal circumstances. Can you describe that, that trip? Yeah, so um, I believe there were like eight checkpoints. Um, so we went with a convoy, a UN convoy. So there were 11 or 14 other vans with other NGOs that were traveling over. So it was very coordinated and organized, I will say. Um, but there were at least three or four checkpoints um, that stopped us at, for a lengthy amount of time. One of them almost turned us away. Um, so it was weird. I, I, it doesn't make sense to me as to why some of them would be like, you know, good luck, continue and, and just let us go, you know? And then there were the few that stopped us and held us for some time. And then the one that like almost literally turned us around and said, come back tomorrow. So I don't know. And these were Egyptian authorities that, that in other words, the checkpoints along the way, you're, you're in Egypt. So these are all, these are, these are checkpoints that are put in place by the Egyptian authorities. Correct, correct which maybe makes even less sense in a way. I don't know. I don't know who's, were, I don't were, know. At any point, did you meet, were there Israeli authorities at any point? Um, Not that I saw, not not on the Egyptian These were all Egyptian, Egyptians. And then 
Now we know that there are, you know, miles and miles and miles of trucks, aid trucks, food trucks that are outside the gates of Gaza waiting to be allowed to come in. How was it that your mission, that your vans were allowed to enter? So, well, it was coordinated with the UN. Um, we were allowed because, you know, we're nonprofit organizations going in to help. There were, you know, like I said, there were quite a few of us. Um, they coordinated it with the Israeli government. So they allowed us in and pretty much what we were were medical mules. I mean, we had to mule over our medical supplies because it wasn't coming in on the aid trucks. So I know it's not that much. You know, there's like back then there were I mean, this was just like a month and a half ago. There were one point nine million um, internally displaced people there. I don't know how many are alive now within the month and a half. Um I mean, there's mass casualties daily. So, um, it, you know, essentially it seems like it's not much. Like, let's say there were six people in my group. Um, let me think cumulatively. I think we probably had maybe like 30 aid workers. And so if you think about all of us bringing in four bags of luggage, I mean, that's that's the amount of supplies that we were able to mule in, essentially, which, by the way, I just heard, which was very disheartening um, because I have a um, friend who is there right now. And I was like, hey, I have a whole bunch of you know supplies still that I wasn't able to take with me. I still have like five boxes at home. I was like, can I send some stuff with you? And he was like, well, um, we just got word that um, Egypt is now war profiteering, so we are not allowed to bring in supplies with us. We have to purchase it from Egypt and then take it over. So I'm that's kind of... I'm surprised it took this long. Yeah. Oh, that's disheartening. The Egyptians this long to figure out there was a there was a buck to be made there. If you're just joining me, this is the uh, Miko Pellet Hour. I'm Miko Pellet. I'm speaking with Nurse Lana, who uh, is a local nurse here in 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 the area, and she just came back from a medical mission. Thankfully, came back safe and sound uh, from a what can only be described as a horrifying medical mission in the Gaza Strip. So you managed to get in. Uh, you go in through the checkpoint through Rafah. You're on the Gaza side, and um, I think it was you because I heard of several people describe this moment where one moment you're that was me. That was yeah. you, right? One moment you're kind of a place that's kind of normal, and then this one step in, everything is different. Can you talk I about time that? Traveled. Yeah, it felt like I went into a time traveling machine. It was it was wild. It was just so we got there um late in the evening. Um it no, it was like 9 p.m. And so it was dark out, and you know, it was a normal area, Egypt, right? And we crossed through the border, which is a matter of maybe, you know, a couple hundred feet. And all of a sudden, you can hear the distant bombing sounds, and you can hear like gun sounds, like well, it sounds like machine guns. I don't know artillery sounds, like it's like you hear that. Um, and then you hear the uh, drones, the buzzing of the drones, which was very annoying. It was super loud. You can't even hear yourself think. It's it's really frustrating. So immediately, like you hear that, and you're like, "Whoa, where am I? Like this is insane." And it is just mind boggling how like just back there, you don't hear this, you don't see this, you don't, you know what I mean? But then you're in Gaza, and all of a sudden, it, it, you are in a war zone immediately. It's it, it's just mind boggling. Yeah, and Rafah is half in the Egyptian side, half inside the Gaza Strip, yeah. the Palestinian side. So. So then you go to the hospital. I'm, I'm assuming you stay. You lived in the hospital. So that was our intent. We actually um, ended up having a safe house, which was nice to have um, because, well, some of our doctors actually stayed in the hospital the whole time. They didn't want to go back and forth. So um, four of us did go back um, to the safe house in the evenings because, I mean, I, I wanted to decompress. You know, I... I I admire the doctors, Dr. Um, Akram and Dr. Galeria. They stayed the whole time in the hospital, which was admirable. But I wanted to decompress. So I would go back to the safe house, which was essentially probably about maybe a 20-minute drive away from the hospital. But because of the fact that there are you know, nearly 2 million people there, it would take us nearly an hour 
to get there um, because of, you know, all the people in the way, the traffic were, was the people in the streets and trying to get through them. So that who, was who, the traffic. Who took care of the transportation? And it's interesting. You feel it's, uh, you know, you feel a need to explain why you needed to go and decompress. You don't need yeah. to explain that. I, mean, I think it's mo most people would perfectly understand that. Um, yeah. So our um, nonprofit organization had a van. Had a van and. And, and a local driver. You're, you're, and was there like a like a Red Cross or Red Crescent on the on the on the roof? I mean, if like yeah, our vehicles are very well marked. Hell, huh? Yeah, our vehicles are very well marked. So it, they it, are marked. Yeah. Yes, That's they are all marked. As they always are. Yeah. As they as they. We, yeah, we have to coordinate our every step with the COGAT. So every step we take before we leave to um, wherever we're going, whether it's clinic or the hospital, we have to call ahead get a green light and then they tell us which path we can take and we have to take that direct path and so COGAT, in case i'm assuming the listeners don't know kogat is the israeli authority that manages the lives of palestinians they uh they coordinate they manage palestinians are are um enslaved for better you know lack of a better word to kogat which is the israeli authority the, the israeli authority that deals with palestinians both in the west bank and the gaza strip in in in, in those in those two areas basically it's 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 the arm of the um military government right that, so yeah. so yeah we coordinated with them um every step of the way um we would get you know green light oh no you can't travel yet so um yeah we were in very well marked vehicles and followed the coordination efforts of the COGAT um, the whole time. Yeah, and you know we all you know in the background. I mean, we know about the 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 World Kitchen um, volunteers that were just murdered by Israel, and I, I think it's important to hear just how well coordinated this oh, is because you have to. I mean, I don't. I, it's there's no question that their vehicles were marked and that their path was coordinated with COGAT as well, and still. We could see by the pictures there were direct hits that that you know that the that they were um, struck with and killed. It's it's so strict that when we were driving over to um, Rafa, I even have the list. I have the list of every van and who was in every van and which organization was in every van. And um, we could not pass each other. They were like, "You have to stay in the single file line that you're driving." Like you know, vans number one through 14 and like van number seven can't go in front of van number six or any, you have to stay in order the whole time. Cannot like cut the other van off or go in front or behind or anything. I mean, you can't allow talked, anybody in front of you. We haven't even talked yet about your work, just about the stuff around it, kind of the logistics. And already I can, I can't imagine the level of stress, the level of anxiety that being in that position now you've already signed that you're willing to die for this. You're going through this these incredibly strict measures. Even the packing. I remember in your presentation you said that you had to make sure that you didn't deviate one pill, one ounce yeah. from what was in the list, or else the whole thing would be rejected. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. this level of anxiety. I can't imagine the anxiety of just going through these measures before you even start yeah. the before you even see a, a single yeah. patient. Yeah, I had to itemize my, I had to give our coordinator for our organization a list of every single item that was in the luggage and the quantity of it and, you know, description of what it was. And if I did, if, you know, I put in an extra bandage by accident, they can reject the whole, like, they, all four bags. And they being the Israelis. Uh, yeah, uh, Egypt and Israelis, uh, whoever at the border is checking. Yeah. So okay, so now you're you're there, and this is your first day. You're at the hospital. Talk about that. Um. So our very first hospital, Najar Hospital, that was an absolute disaster. Where is this in Rafah in Gaza? Which city is it in? Where were you? Uh, that is that is in Rafah. Um. It is. It is a small 60 bed hospital, but there were over 300 admissions. Um, so very overpopulated. Uh, let me describe this to you. So I walk into the ER 
And immediately I see people like swarmed all around, lots of family members, you know, there's the very family oriented people. So if one person is injured or ill, like the family accompanies, right? Like all 10 family members will accompany this one person. So I walk in and it's super, like it's a room the size of, I mean, it is a small, it is like maybe, I don't know the square footage, but it's a small, like a urgent care sized facility, the ER, so it's right? Like an, it's not like an emergency room in a regular hospital you drive no. out, it's like enormous and there are all these different stalls and people and doctors. It's no, it's that. literally like the size of a, like a, like a coffee shop. Like, you know, and it's like, like a, a good sized coffee shop. But so there's a whole um, bunch of people there and we walk in with scrubs on, right? Immediately when they see scrubs, they all like flock to us with papers. They have triage papers and they're like, doctor, 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 help me. You know, like I have a relative here, an injured, you know, friend here or whatever. And so immediately they like bombard us and they're like, help us, help us, giving us their triage papers. And so- um Let me interrupt you just a second. So what language are they speaking and what language- Arabic. And what language is every? I mean, what what language does everybody else I was, speak? I was the only one that knew Arabic, actually, and my so, Arabic is not you, perfect. I'm assuming the the papers they're get, showing you are also in Arabic. Arabic, all and Arabic. nobody speaks Arabic. In other words, except for you, you're the exception. The rest of the crew, they don't speak Arabic. So they they're right there, right there. We've got this enormous obstacle, right? Yes, enormous for them. Like I, I, it would feel yeah very odd if I was in a different country. Like, you know, like if I was in China and I'm getting papers with Chinese writing and, you know, everyone's speaking to me in their language, I'd be like, what, what do I do? Like, it, it is hard. Like, what am I assessing? If it's not visibly obvious, what am I assessing? You know? So fortunately, how did, I mean, you, how did you overcome? How did everybody overcome that? I mean, that's a small detail. Me. Is how, What? So either me, like if I was with one of them, I would translate or um, the doctors there, you know, they're educated. So the doctors knew English. And if they were next to one of the local physicians, then they would also translate. So you always needed a local doctor to translate and be a go-between or a local period to be a go-between you and your work or not you specifically because you you speak Arabic, but others uh, to even. So, so the fact that they're coming to you with these papers does them right. no good because you most people don't know what the papers are saying or what these people are saying right it's a barrier i mean and my and my arabic is okay <laughs> my arabic i mean I, i'm fluent enough but not perfect you know i'm not great and um their not dialect literally. is a little different so it was a little like complicated for me as well i was like what? like i don't I, I like some of the words that they used i was like i don't know what that is but yeah. you know i can figure it out the context from the rest of the sentence but um so right when we walk in you know we have all these people um handing us papers and we just kind of go over in um oh this one person was like hey help me um i have a family member in this like one room so there was like this one patient room kind of i i don't know if it was a if it was a trauma bay versus a patient room but we go in there we follow this person right and there are five other patients in this one room, right? And three of them had like uh, stretchers that they were in and two were just lying on the ground. And right immediately, right when I walk in, my eyes immediately go to the people on the ground and all I see are like pale yellow feet. And I was like, oh, I know dead feet when I see dead feet. So I looked over at the orthopedic surgeon who was next to me and I was like, hey, is this guy alive? And he was like, I don't know. So I was like, okay, like let's check a pulse because he doesn't look alive. Like I, those feet look dead to me. So um, we check and he's not alive. So this guy is lying dead on the ground in front of these alive patients. And I don't even know that they knew that he was dead. They probably thought he was just sleeping or I don't know. I mean, I was like, this is absurd. Like, this is crazy. Like there's a dead body right here on the ground in front of these, and, the, and they all had their family members around them. So there were at least like 20 people in that one room. So I was like, that's just insane. And like body, And there's a dead body right there. Yeah, I was like in shock. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was like, they're not weirded out by that, like that there was a dead body, but then it dawned on me that maybe they didn't even realize that he was dead. It was odd. Mm -hmm. So I was like, wow, that was my very first patient experience there, that. And I was like, oh my goodness. Like that was my, that was the prelude to what I was going to be seeing. And, and this is like, a, like I said, they call it a hospital, a Najar hospital, but it's a glorified urgent care. Like they didn't even have a CAT scan machine in there. They don't have many resources that they need that a you know, fully functioning hospital should what have. Kind of cases were, what kind of cases were you taking care of there? What was going on? So um, there were a array of things. I mean, there were people coming in, CPR in progress, uh, people having heart attacks, people being, you know, hit by shrapnel. So lots of shrapnel wounds, um, uh, people dehydrated. Um, I had one man um, who was lying on the ground and his, I, I assume his grandson, because he was probably like 20 years old or like 19, 18. He was like, hey, can you see um, this guy? He pointed to him and it was an older man. He was lying by the window on a mattress. Yeah, like I said, it's a very small place. It's not like hard to see everyone. Um, he had he had been lying there for 10 days, unlike seen. No one ever triaged him. No one ever, he didn't have an IV line in him or anything. So he was there for 10 days and no one had seen him. His abdomen was so distended that I thought he had a tumor. And I asked his um, relative, I was like, does he have any health problems? He was like, he has a prostate problem but that's it he has no other health problems and I was like uh why is his belly like that he was like I don't know I mean it just started since he's been in the hospital so um we do an ultrasound and it is his bladder his bladder was so backed up and full that it it, it, it swelled like he was pregnant so we put in a catheter drained him of like two liters of urine and then his belly descended like it just went down I mean, so sorry. Simple, well, the, so the simplest procedure sorry, sorry. you would do, like in five, like in, in five minutes in in an ER. Yeah. yeah, deflated his belly. Yeah, it was crazy. I was like, oh my god, that was all like backup, and and he was this guy was obtunded. Like he actually he was not responsive, beyond uh, obtunded. He was like I was doing a sternal rub trying to wake him up, and he would kind of withdraw the pain, but that was it. Like he was nonverbal. But after we got him um, IV fluids in he started to slowly wake up but this guy was like at death's door literally at death's door he would have easily died that evening it was wild if you're joining me just now this is the amico pellet hour i'm amico pellet i'm speaking to nurse lana about her experience um volunteering in the gaza strip we're gonna take a little break right now and we'll be right back Welcome back to the Miko Pellet Hour. I'm your host, Miko Pellet. I'm speaking with Nurse Lana, who just returned from medical mission volunteering uh, uh, to, uh, to provide aid in hospitals in the Gaza Strip. Um, she was telling us how before she left, she had to basically agree uh, to a very difficult condition, which was that she may never come back and to come to terms with that and then go ahead and, and, and go through this process of going into a genocide zone so this is worse than a war zone in a way. It's not a natural catastrophe, an earthquake or a tsunami. This is an ongoing genocide. And you're going into the side that is being bombarded and massacred voluntarily, knowing full well that aid workers and journalists and others have been targeted and killed in the past. And of course, we know the, the, you know, the World Kitchen uh, people were just killed. You're telling us how every step of the way had to be coordinated, every trip had to be coordinated with the Israeli authorities. So the Israeli authorities know very well where the aid workers are, where they're going, what, they're, what vehicles they're who using. Who they are. They know who every they person that's in the vehicle, name and background and everything. So they know everybody that's in each vehicle and where they are going. And yet we know that they've been targeted. Um, and so the kind of the excuse that some of these um, killings are somehow... Uh, an accident or a mistake is completely, completely unfounded. And I think that's a really good point you made there. Thank you. So you were describing you were at Al Najjar. It's your first day. You're at Al Najjar Hospital in in Rafah, small, but you said was not really a hospital. It's more like a quote unquote a glorified uh, urgent care. Very small people on the ground. You just saved the life of somebody who could have been saved with five minutes if he walked into a normal hospital. Mm -hmm. Keep talking about that, about that particular experience that day and, and, and what happened. 
so um there was also this one situation where um the paramedics had come in with a patient that was cpr in progress and um then like five minutes later i hear a bunch of commotion screaming and it sounds like someone's fighting so i look behind and i guess it's this guy who came in cpr in progress son it was like a teenage son and all these guys were holding him back. He was like, you know, screaming and yelling for his dad. And they're all trying to hold him back. And he's freaking out, spazzing out. And then the guy dies. And oh my gosh, it was the most tragic sight and scene. And the sounds of his cries are haunting. Like, I will never forget it. It, it, it was so sad. Like, I can't imagine. I cannot imagine that much destruction and death and and hurt and pain. And And it's not usually one person. It's like... People lose their whole lineage in a day. So it's it, it was very disheartening. And it was just so overwhelming and chaotic. I mean, we had a two-year-old who fell off of like a three-story balcony and needed a CAT scan for his head because he obviously had a brain bleed. And they didn't have that. We had to transfer him out to European Gotha Hospital. And um, he got there. Hours later, he died. I mean... It's because they don't have the means to take care of these people. It was so bad and so chaotic there that we could not help. That was our first and last day there. We did not go back because it was beyond the situation of helping. Like, it was beyond that. Like, it was just to the point of no return, really. Like, it was it was terrible. And the staff, so I only saw maybe four doctors there. And nurses, uh, I don't know, maybe like a handful so for the hundred. You're saying it was maybe a 60 bed hospital, which is very small, no. but that there are over 300 people there on the floor. Admitted. Else, and you're saying there were how many doctors? Uh, this is just in the ER part. Um, yeah. In the ER, maybe I saw four doctors, maybe. And then as far as nurses, I mean, maybe six. And I mean, for hundreds of people. The situation is not normal. Not it's not even a normal situation. This is a situation where there's the massive amounts of injuries. The ratios are not All okay. Right. <laughs> it's not safe. Comprehended. Yeah. Yeah. What did you do after that. So after that, uh, so we went there, um, and, and and unfortunately did not go back. I mean, they are the ones that need the most help. But it was like I said to the point of no return almost who like that, who makes that determination if you stay at a hospital or move on to another one or if it's beyond help there's got to be somebody who makes that really so could have, be a horrifying determination i mean i can't imagine looking back at people saying sorry we can't help you we're moving on but who makes that determination um so we did have a local coordinator there as well as um a a coordinator that came in from our side so they were the ones that coordinated with the hospitals and and the clinics that we went to they determined that you're you'd be you'd have there'd be better use for you yeah and we would give them our opinions like you know this is this is not you know unfortunately a situation that we can help or let's try somewhere else like so where did so, you get after that so after that, um, I ended up going to um, our, my NGO had a clinic there and um, they in this clinic, they so it was like a mother baby, like maternal um, clinic, as well as like a miniature ER, like urgent care. Like, this is still in Rafa. This is in Salah Sultan. Yeah, which is Rafa. But so just so you understand the geography, the Gaza Strip is kind of long and narrow, and you come in from Egypt, you come in from the south, and the first town there is Rafah, and then you, you know, you go north from there. So you're oh. still in that, in that. Yeah, I, I, the whole time I stayed in. Um, I'm sorry. Um, the whole time I stayed in Rafah. Okay, can so you you're still in that southern. Yes, yes, I can hear you and see you fine. Yeah. Okay, um, so then you just moved to a different clinic. So, so yeah. Well, the well European Gaza is, I think, Khan Yunis. So that's as far up north as I got. But um, so yeah, Salah Sultan is in Rafah. Um, and so that's where clinic was. And so they also had a wound care um, side too. So they would see anywhere between two to 400 patients a day. Um, very busy. Oh, well, that was just in the ER and wound care side. Um, that's not even like the women and children side. So it, it's a very busy clinic. So we did that for two days, which was actually... Um, that was probably the most gratifying part of 
my mission trip there because I actually felt like I did something, you know, like in the hospital setting, I, I felt like, I don't know, like it, I'll, I'll describe that in a bit, but let me stick to the clinic real quick. Um, I did the urgent care, like the wound care section with one of the orthopedic surgeons. So we tag teamed and we took care of everyone's wounds. What we were seeing there um, was a bunch of cellulitis. So, uh, so they, I want to do a shoe drive for these people. Let me tell you, they all wear either they're barefoot because they've been displaced and, you know, rushed out of their homes. Literally, some of them told me that they literally had a one minute warning to evacuate. One minute warning. They were like, you have to evacuate your home and in one minute. So they literally didn't even have shoes or anything. They ran. So a lot of them are barefoot and they're walking free everywhere broken glass, rocks, you know, and so they would get these cuts on their feet and then get horrible infections. And we would have to debride and, you know, clean out their wounds and wrap their feet. And, um, and then the rest of them just had like flip flops on or their little slides, you know, that they wear. And so their feet are all destroyed, you know, cuts everywhere, infections everywhere. Um, lots of shrapnel wound injuries, bullets, um, embedded in their tissue, um, and you just have to keep it there, but you're just like cleaning around the infected wound site. Um, you have to keep it there until they go to like an OR, I suppose, or somebody's going to operate. Yeah, sometimes depending on where it is, it, it would cause more damage to try to remove it. So you just have to leave it in. So sometimes it's occluding a vessel, uh, you know, so if you remove it and, and, and you can't risk that there because they don't have much blood to, you know, transfuse. Because you don't have the means to stop the blood and then fix the blood vessel. The, the doctors opt to keep the bullet in the body because that is a safer bet for the patient. So again, I, I want people to kind of let this all sink in. We're talking about this horror that's taking place this massive slaughter of people being bombed, you know, in, in every direction, running out of their homes at a minute notice, grabbing their kids, running barefoot, and this laceration of the feet. Again, this is these are small details that I don't think even people think about, but you know, it's horribly painful. And then you have to run with it and walk with it and get oh. some with it, and there's nobody to treat it, and you don't have bandages, you don't have ointment like in the fridge that you can pull out there's no antibiotics and imagine clean water to clean with yeah they didn't even have clean water to clean their wounds with and that was very tough to tailor our discharge instructions to these people that like here we're normal we're normally like able to be like okay you know keep that area clean um use mild soap and water to you know clean your wound apply antibiotic ointment wrap it up with this you know gauze ace wrap whatever um, have a nutritious meal, like high protein diet, because that helps your wounds heal. Like you can't tell them that because they're all displaced and they live in tents. How can I say, keep your feet clean? They don't have shoes. Like, how do I say, or okay, walk, walk out of here. They don't even have for, in the presentation, you said you, 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 you normally tell people to stay hydrated and you can't tell these people to stay hydrated because they don't have access to water. Right. Like, it's like, I feel like that's taunting them to say, drink plenty of fluids. Like, you know, so I was like, what do I, how do I give them discharge instructions? It was very difficult. Like I, I would just tell them, you know, to the best of your ability, try to keep this area clean, keep it wrapped, you know, um, wear a sock. If you can find one, put a sock over this. Like it was so tough to tailor because I didn't think about that going in. So, you know, I just, I, I just was like, oh my gosh, I got, I have to tailor my everyday spiel. And um, so that was a little challenging. And also, like, I'm so used to saying when you get home, you know, when I discharge patients, when you get home, blah, blah, blah. Like, I, I felt bad saying when you get home because they, they're not going home. They're going to a tent, you know, so. And many of them like, live in the hospital. From here. Saying that they need to actually just live in the hospital or around the hospital. In the hospital, too. Oh, yeah. So at European Gaza Hospital, they were all, like thousands of people living in the hospital again the things we take for granted like go home stay hydrated basic hygiene soap and water does not exist does not exist so mm -hmm. when it's you and you're an adult and you're going through this pain and this the, you know these injuries it's bad enough but as a parent when you have a child and you can't care for them because you don't have the water the soap the band you, you know uh, kids have a little cut we put a band-aid with a little smiley face on it 
Nothing at all. I mean, the, the, the lack of humanity in the daily details, in the day-to-day -day stuff. Yeah. And I was there in February, so it was freezing at night. It was so cold. And so they would, um, you know, have like little campfires to try to warm up. And we used to get so many burns from the children because, you know, children are children. They're going to like, you know, fall into the fire or, you know, they want to warm their hands and they get too close or, you know, children are just, you know, reckless sometimes. So we had a lot of burn injuries and a lot of um, lacerations because there were, you know, there was broken glass or rubble and they would just slice their hands or feet or, you know, fall, hit their head. So it was, it was really tough it, and it was freezing outside. So on top of all of that, you're hypothermic. And so that's not going to properly help heal your wounds either. I mean, that's, it, it was just the, the most unimaginable situation ever. Like everything is working against these people, the conditions, the weather, the rain. And when it would rain, it was a oh, disaster for them because they don't have roads that they're camping on. They're camping on like sand or dirt. So then it becomes mud and, you know, and it's just a disaster. Like everything works against them. They have no water, no food, no, you know, heating source, electricity. They were using solar panels. I saw quite a few tents with like little solar panels outside of their tents. And they would like have um, like a um, bunch of phones plugged in, like charging. But it takes, they were telling me it could take a whole day to get a full charge. You know, as you say these things, two things come to mind. One is uh, that 10 minute 15 minute drive at the most from any point in the Gaza Strip, uh, driving east, um, outside of the Gaza prison, uh, outside of this concentration camp where over two million people have been have been uh, you know locked up for 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 years and years and years. There's an abundance, of food, clean water, um, all the medical supplies, all the medical care, the best facilities except Israel does not want to let these people in. And this is really the source of the issues. They're not only bombing them, but they're also denying them access to the abundance because Israelis on the other side of the border, on the other side of that prison fence, you know, live a good life. I mean, there's everything. There's everything. There's nice roads. There's uh, plenty of electricity. There's water. There's food. There's great, you know, medical facilities. The problem is that not... You know, and you have to come in through Cairo and fly to Rafa, uh, fly to Cairo, drive to Rafah, go through eight checkpoints in order to enter this hell where people can't even have a little bit of antibiotic to put on a on a wound on a, on a cut or a band aid for their kids, and a ten minute drive from any point actually in the Gaza Strip, you have everything because Israel has everything, and they just are denying these people entry. So not only bombing them, killing them, denying them food, but they're denying them access. Again, get rid of the fence. Let people go. Yeah. Yeah. Listen. And those little cuts are deadly for us. They're not. For them, they are because they get infected and it just bruises and bruises and they don't have the antibiotics and they become septic and sepsis is deadly. So then they die from essentially a minor laceration. Yeah. It's crazy. Like it's, I was like, this is stuff that's easily curable, treatable. A cut. They die from a cut. It's mind-boggling. Let's let that sink in. You know, uh, people are listening, the audience. Um, if you're just joining me, this is the Miko Pellet Hour. I'm speaking to Nurse Lana, who's describing what it was like to volunteer as a medical uh, worker in the Gaza Strip, um, and just recently uh, came back. You know, the other the other thing. So I want I want I want your words to just sink in in people's in people's minds and hearts a little bit. Just just how how cruel and severe the, the reality in which Palestinians have been placed for no fault of their own. You know, Palestinians through no fault of their own whatsoever. I know people try to blame Palestinians on their faith um, and what is happening to them, but there's no blame whatsoever can be placed on Palestinians. None whatsoever. You know, the other thing that came to mind as you were speaking, especially about the tents and the water and the rain and the cold, there's some, uh, you know, incredible short stories by Hassan Kanafani. Hassan Kanafani is a well-known and, and incredibly talented Palestinian writer. 
and he's written about the Palestinian experience, I think, perhaps better than anybody has ever written. He was a prolific writer and he was assassinated. He was in his 30s and he was murdered by Israel. Him and his 16-year-old uh, niece, Lamise, were, were killed in a car bomb in Lebanon by Israel. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a short story, I think it's called The Stolen Shirt. And it begins where you see this man, it's pouring rain, he's standing by the tent, his wife and child are in the tent. And he's outside in the pouring rain, leaning on a, on a pick. And he's digging a little, um, you know, a little groove around the tent to prevent the water from coming in. And he's standing there. And that's the, how the story begins and so on. It's a short story. But you're describing this horrifying reality. Now, he's talking about refugees, you know, going long, long time ago. And this experience of Palestinians living in this horror, this horror that's been imposed on them, again, through no fault of their own, you know, it's been going on for almost 80 years, almost yeah. 80 decades. And now we are in there in Gaza, and these people are mostly refugees from other parts of Palestine. And, and generation after generation, they still have to go through this, this horror where, like you're saying, a, a cut, a, a small cut on your foot could kill you. And if it's, again, think about the children. You know, Gaza, as one great journalist, Char Charlie Glass, wrote, Gaza is a world of children. It's, a, it's full of children. Yeah. So, so, okay, so you spent, you said a couple of days at this other small clinic. Right. What happens next? Where'd you go next? So um, after that, I actually ended up going to European Gaza Hospital, which is now their last standing sizable hospital. Um, and it's not even fully functioning either, but it's their last sizable one. Um, and that one, I think, um, can hold up to 300 patients, but they had over a thousand admissions when I was there. So once again, they're over 300% the capacity. So people are on the floor waiting to be helped, like that first uh, older gentleman that you described in the very first hospital, you know, a cure something that could have been fixed and cured in, you know, it, it, as soon as he was admitted, he was there for 10 days. And so I'm expecting there's probably a lot because it's not life-threatening, he's not gushing blood, you know, he's left, uh, right. you know, he's left there. So there's probably a lot of that that you're seeing. Uh, well, yeah, and there were a lot of um, people with, um, well, it's suspected cholera. They don't know because they don't have a lab to test it, but um, definitely hepatitis A. So lots of people with diarrhea. I mean, oh, when we drove in to Rafah, when we were driving to our safe house, it's right on the sea on, you know, we drove across, you know, on the shoreline and that's where all the tents are the smell was atrocious. I mean, it smelled like pure diarrhea. Like right when you're driving in, I'm in a van and immediately it hits me. Our windows are up and everything. You smell this like a very offensive odor. And um, they, they don't have bathrooms there. So what they do is they dig in the sand a hole and they like put sheets up like in a circle around this hole where people have to defecate and I guess I don't know I guess they were rinsing off in the Mediterranean Sea I mean I don't know how they're cleaning themselves so um it, it smelled really bad so there was a lot of dehydration like you said um a lot of people who would go to the hospital were there because they had hepatitis um they were ill you know diarrhea dehydrated and whatever and like you said if if you don't physically see uh, you know, a limb that's cut off or bleeding or, you know, an obvious sign of injury, then you kind of get um, pushed to the back burner. And those people are just as critical. I mean, you need yeah, water so, to yeah, survive. How quickly, how quickly is the dehydrated child going to die? Oh, very. They're made up of 80% of water. So for a child, easily they can die from that. Rapidly. I mean, the, the, that's they're made up of more water than they are anything else. So it's very important that they get hydrated. But like you said, if they don't have a physical, visibly like visible physical injury, then you kind of get unseen. So He's joining um, me again. This is the Nico Pellet Hour. We're speaking to Nurse Lana about her experience as an aid worker in a uh, medical aid worker in, in Gaza. And again, people are saying, when, when people talk about famine and the diseases, you talked about cholera and there's the possibility of cholera and there's no, they don't have the ability to test. Again, five minute drive, 10 minute drive from there, there's all the medical facilities, you know, the best, uh, some of the best medical facilities in the world. 
um, and people dying from curable, easily curable diseases. So they're not just being killed by the bombing and by the, you know, being trapped in the rubble and being choked by the gases and the fire and so on. Uh, they're being killed by curable diseases that are as a result of the fact that they have no ability to, you know, you've got millions of people who are living in tents without basic hygiene, without proper, you know, bathrooms. Yeah, or they're dying because they don't have access to those aid trucks that are backloaded in Egypt. Um, the fact that they needed 500 in a day before October 7 is, you know, evidence that this issue has been long going. It's not an October 7 issue. I mean, just simply by the fact that they needed 500 aid trucks in a day prior to. I remember seeing an event of, a, of another medical, uh, kind of a medical uh, non nonprofit that focused on Palestine. And um, there was a video, this is years ago. And one of the points they were making was a child with a curable disease in the Gaza Strip will die. A child, you know, a few kilometers away on the Israeli side with the exact same thing will live. It's as simple as that. And this is, like I said, long before October 7th. This is years and years ago. And that's a reality that Israel created. So it's hard to it's hard to divorce the humanitarian from the political because the humanitarian disaster is, is caused by a political situation. In other words, Israel's desire to exterminate the Palestinian people, and I know this sounds extreme, but I can't, I, I don't know how else to describe it. I don't think, I think the evidence is, is overwhelming, especially listening to you, even, even more so having listened to you and what you describe. Um, it's, uh, it's, 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 a, you know, it's a, Palestinians are, you know, there's no reason for Palestinians to live like this. There's no reason for anyone to live in uh, anywhere in historic Palestine to live like this. There's, there's, you know, or around the world. I mean, around the world for that matter. But I say in Palestine because there's abundance. It's a very rich country. There's a lot of money there. There's the economy is good as long as you are an Israeli Jew. And the problem is that Israel does not want to share what Israeli Jews have with everybody else. And it's not like if they did, it would hurt anybody else. It's like sharing this abundance would hurt, or 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 somebody would be, you know. In, in in need this is plenty you know the people in gaza could be living a good healthy productive life but israel is denying them this bombing them and then letting them die of you know lacerations you know simple yeah cancer. and it's not it's not a, a simple death it's like an agonizing like it's a painful long torturous death if they if they survive the bombings like the ones who got amputated in the hospital, right? Like I saw more amputations in European Gaza hospital in the one week that I was there. Like, so I worked in a shock trauma center in Baltimore, right? And we did plenty of amputations. I was there for two years. I saw more amputations there in the one week that I was there than I did in two years working in a shock trauma center in America. Why like, is that? Why is that? Just the amount of bombings missiles or quadcopters they would call them for the drones some of them were assault ones assault drones and um it, it, they would shoot at them um but it was like it wasn't like a bullet it was like missiles or something i don't know they would come obliterated i'm not i'm not in the military i don't know anything about artillery i don't know the terms or what weapons were being used, but whatever it was, these people were coming with obliterated body like parts. And they had a whole bunch of micro shrapnel all over their body, like head to toe. It's something I've never seen. It's like, uh, I saw a term finally the other day, it was, uh, what was it shrapnel freckles or something? So it's like a bunch of micro shrapnel that embeds in their skin. And you literally have to dissect as much of it out as you can, because I'm mean, like I said, they don't really have a lab to test, but the doctors there suspected that there was maybe uranium in um, these, whatever shellings they were using, because the wound site where the shrapnel um, would land would get angrier by the day. Like it would grow, the, the size of the wound would grow. It would get more, um, like pus drainage. So it wouldn't and heal, it would, it would get worse. It would get worse as the even days would go it, on. It would get worse. Even after you treat well, it. Well, we didn't have IV antibiotics. They were out of IV antibiotics, so we could not treat it that in that way. The way we would treat it is by every day bringing these patients back for wound care. So we would have to irrigate it and debris it and like 
you know, just with like their saline bags, we would have to flush the wound sites. I mean, that's how we were cleaning it. Uh, we didn't have any other way to clean it other than irrigating it with like saline bags. So, and then trying to pick out as much of the shrapnel as we can. So, um, it, it was like just all over their bodies. Everybody that I saw like had that. And I was like, what is this? That is like exploding all from head to toe on them. So, um, I, we don't know. Uh, the doctor said it's something they've never seen before. They were like, we've never seen this kind of injury. Like, we don't know. Neither so, trauma, trauma doctors, trauma surgeons. Yeah. Well, well uh, yeah. time is up. I mean, we could be talking uh, about this forever. I really, really appreciate your, your time. I appreciate your courage, your having done this. I mean, this is above and beyond uh, what most almost anybody would would be willing to go through and do and and I, I have no I no no doubt in my mind that your contributions were meant more meant the world to the people that you did that you touched I hope, I hope. part of me wonders if I just prolonged their agony or prolonged the inevitable so I, I came back I think it's about the fact that they know somebody cares enough to put their life at yeah. risk be there yeah. for and for their children and that's the lasting effect of your work obviously right in the face of this massive war machine right the ability of, of of people to help is very small physically but i think there's a larger picture here and that's and that's where you came in once again you've been listening to the miko pellet hour i'm miko pellet uh thank you for tuning in we've got soul conversations coming up next i'll see you again next week